Hello again. Uh, I am Kenny Fikes, host of your I Know Media Roundtable, and this is where we bring you conscientious clarity along with empirical experience, alongside reasoned analysis and application. Um, how are you doing today, Elisa Simmons? I'm doing well. Hey guys, I'm Elisa Simmons, and I am a Montessori teacher in East Texas, and I'm ready for tonight's conversation. Wonderful. Look at that grin on your face. Uh, did you get a gift or something today? You look really happy. Me or Jay yeah. Sheree? Me? Oh, no. It's the beginning of the school year, so everything gets to be new, and I love renewal. You're excited. Got it. Jay Sheree, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for asking. Hi, I'm Jay Ellis, and I am a mom of three. I'm a physician, and I'm a disability advocate, and excited to be here. And part of why I was smiling was because Lisa was making me laugh what I needed it today. Awesome. Well, thank you for um, the topic of today, Jay Sheree, that we'll be discussing. But Michael's not here today, so we want to say hello and we miss you. And um, he got called away for an emergency. Uh, was it neonatal? Or yeah, he said like he had that? a sick baby going to make you. <laughs> got it. Okay, so today uh, we, we, we gave you a teaser last time as an introduction um, to today's show about the American Disabilities Act of 1990. 1990. Wow. Mm -hmm. So um, we will start with another little introduction from Jay Sheree, uh, talk about today, and I'll shoot maybe a question or two, and we'll go around with the three of us. So let's have at it. Okay. Um, and it looks like my, okay, yeah, my internet froze for a second. We, so we wanted to bring more information to everyone about the ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And as you heard Kenny reference, this act wasn't passed until 1990. Um, the act gives basic civil rights to people who have disabilities because prior to 1990, they didn't. It was perfectly fine to discriminate against them based upon their disability. They could be denied access to housing. Um, they could be denied access to schools. They didn't have to be given any particular rights. And um, up until 1976, kids with disabilities didn't have the right to an education. So part of why this is remarkable is that all of this legislation took place in contemporary times. Um, and, and, and it's interesting to consider that because our Civil Rights Act of 1964, when it occurred, you'd think that it would cover everyone, but, but it didn't. And so we just celebrated the 30th anniversary of the ADA, and this is part of why we wanted to bring this to you. Um, we want um, everyone to be aware of what the legislation says, um, and it very well may impact you personally or someone that you love. Even if you think that it wouldn't, it may just impact you every day at work, um, even during this coronavirus quarantine um, and pandemic. And so we wanted to make sure that you have this basic information and we're excited to share it with you. Turn it back over to you, Kenny. Yeah, it, it blows my mind that it wasn't enacted until 1990, but it also blows my mind that the Civil Rights Act didn't happen until 1964, that women suffrage didn't take place until it did, but not to make all of these comparisons because sometimes um, for me, it can be a little annoying when people do all the comparisons like, um, you know, make gay rights, black rights or black rights, women's rights. So, so I think American Disabilities Act deserves its own attention. We will have some comparisons that make sense to shed light on it, but um, sort of shame on us for waiting until 1990, right? Uh, Elisa. Yeah, I, you know what? I think that a lot of people, though, when it comes to stuff like with disabilities, because some people don't realize the how layered the ideal of disabilities are and how at any given time, the wrong turn in your car could need you to respect this act. Like the a fall down some stairs, a fall off a ladder could have you needing this act really bad. So I think it's one of those topics that people don't think about until they need it. And I think that's correct. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it sounds harsh to say, but one thing that uh, many people who are disability advocates will tell you, you can join this community and this minority population at any point in time. Whereas with other disenfranchised groups, you can't, you know, you mm -hmm. cannot become Korean if you are not born Korean, but you can oh, become oh. disabled. Did you, did you want to ask something? No, no, oh, no. I thought you were done. You can, you can become disabled at any time. And um, disability um, is not just something physical. It can be invisible. 
you know, there are a lot of people who suffer from psychiatric disorders that are impairing. And that's another thing about medical problems. They can become impairing. So let's take asthma, for instance. Most people who have asthma can just use a nebulizer or use their inhaler and they're okay. But there are people who have asthma that is so severe that it actually gets in the way of their normal functioning. Um, they may not be able to do different things. Um, I had a cousin who, as a child, she had severe asthma. She was always wheezing. Um, her asthma was triggered by allergies. Her asthma was triggered by weather. Her asthma was triggered by emotion, and it was severe. And I remember that as children, she couldn't always do the things that everyone else did. So yes. this goes to the occasion of being a disability. When we look at things like arthritis as we get older, if that arthritis is severe enough, then it impairs your walking, it impairs your mobility, it impairs your balance, um, and it will interfere with what you might need to do or want to do. And so we have to remember that medical conditions can become impairing. And, um, and as Elisa pointed out, if you have an accident or just getting older, your vision goes, your hearing goes, now you have a disability. That's right. And so it's important for us to know that this legislation exists so that if we um, end up with any of these conditions, we can continue to live, work, and play in the community like everyone else. So, so can you tell me a little bit about what, uh, um, or maybe after Lisa adds something if she has something now, but my interest right, is to know um, what qualifies as a disability under the American Disabilities Act, because I heard you talk about asthma, I talk, heard you talk about arthritis, and maybe it's to the degree. I know that I grew up with a first cousin who genetically is like a brother because our mothers are identical twins, but he lived with us for a while because his mother had asthma so bad that she was afraid that she could have an attack that would leave her unable to care for him. So it was so bad for her that he stayed with us for about two years. Um, so go ahead. You know what, I think, I think it's interesting though that if we each can share a story how we're not physically ourselves affected, but we know someone who is. And I think so many people don't think about that, that it, you need to be an advocate, not only for the people that you're included with. And so speaking up, my mother-in-law is legally blind. She went blind about 10 years ago. Um, she, her life, like her life is super confined now because she's, she cannot see. And so, uh, and so the, you know, having accommodations for her in places that are standard are really beneficial to all of us, but then also they affect the whole family because like Kenny was saying, his, cousin had to live with him it's this ripple effect of affection of how who it affects and I think that's why staying on top of topics like this really benefit everybody as a whole OJ tell us more now well just in reference to when a medical problem becomes disabling is anytime it gets into the way of or interferes with your ability to carry out an everyday function. So if it stops you from working, it stops you from driving. For instance, some people who have seizure disorder, they have to relinquish their licenses because their seizures are that common and um, that frequent, and they are unable to prevent them sufficiently, they can't drive anymore. So that becomes a disability for them. Um, and so any function that you can establish has been impaired because of a medical problem makes it a disability, and that means that you are now eligible or if your services to get through special education, let's say, um, or eligible for accommodations at work, reasonable accommodations so that you can go to work and you can make a living. Um, and so we need to know that, that these things can happen, but that there is a remedy for them when they do. Gotcha. You know, speaking of uh, disabilities that you can't see, um, so I'll tell you a little bit about something I'm, I'm really, over the years, I've been good about and something that may even sound patronizing because I'm okay calling myself out. What I'm, what I'm good about is I oftentimes see people get angry with others that are being unreasonable. And even myself, I'll, I will, my temperature will raise and I go, hmm, here we go again. I'm not a doctor, but mental illness is rampant. Mm -hmm. And this person is being so unreasonable and disconnected, I'm not gonna get angry back with them because something's not right here. I'm pretty good about that. I may overdiagnose, <laughs> but I'm pretty good about that. The thing that I'm not so good about is sometimes because it's not, there's not, I don't have any physical disabilities in my immediate family, 
I overlook it and I kind of forget about it until it smacks me in the face and I see a problem. Like even on this show, Michael's not here tonight. So I started thinking, who could I get really quickly to be a guest? And I almost gratuitously thought of Greg, Craig Land, the guy I grew up with whose sons, um, um, I'm not even sure exactly what the condition is, but um, it's either paraplegic, or, but he's been in a, in, in a wheelchair for a long time, you know, the high, you know, how I was in. So he's mentally fine, but almost can do nothing for himself. Um, and so that's kind of patronizing, right? To think like, who do I know with a kid with a disability that I can call that can be, you know, kind of thing. Um, so we all have to get better about that because if it's out of sight, sometimes it's out of mind. And, and that's, that's not a good thing, right? Well, you know, I think though that there's a fine line between patronizing and then giving the opportunity for a voice. And I think it all depends on how that person receives it because Kenny, like you, I had the exact same thing. I was like, I bet he's trying to find someone. I have a uncle and an aunt whose daughter, their 18 year old was born with uh, cerebral palsy and their seven year old was born um, deaf. And so I, w I w had the exact same thought, but I was like, well, it would give them a platform, but then it's like, well, I don't ever talk to them. So can I really call them right now? That's not cool. <laughs> right. Right. But, but you know, I think that you can, right? Because um, if someone were calling you that maybe you didn't talk to a lot, but they simply wanted your perspective on a challenge that they know that you have in life, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be upset about it, right? You really wouldn't. You'd be like, well, okay, either you would participate or you wouldn't. Most people, I don't think, would really take it personally, but I think we do kind of second guess that because we're afraid of being offensive. And, um, and so the yes. thing that, that they often tell you, like when you're learning about disability advocacy, is basically, you know, people with disabilities think the way that we do about most things. And so things that probably wouldn't bother us, wouldn't bother them. I think as long as um, we're respectful in how we ask, um, and we're aware of the language that we use when we're, when we're asking, and we're talking to them about their disabilities. Um, definitely, you know, you mentioned mental illness and, and that's something that can be a hard one because for some people, their mental illness is impairing and it can be incapacitating. The challenge with mental illness is that it is an invisible disability. And so we don't tend to have a lot of tolerance for what's going on because maybe we don't even know. We just think that this person is weird or strange or peculiar and, um, and we're not trying to understand. So that becomes challenging. And then of course, if they're with law enforcement, right? That's always a big problem. When there's an invisible disability, whether it's something like autism or bipolar illness, um, it, you know, the police officer may not know, the first responder may not know. And they're already dealing with people in stressful situations who may not yes. have the capacity to kind of self-regulate. Um, and so there's a great opportunity for harm because the disability is invisible and the, and the person may not even know to tell them. Right. So, so two two things that run in my family and um i don't think i have either one of them one is like super smart people there's some super smart people in my that's family that's definitely that and, definitely and, not and true. the other quite honestly i mean i'm um i i i think that asthma and and um the skin eczema almost oh. run on the same gene so i almost wonder if mental illness and brilliance run together because there's, we've got a little history of mental illness in my family, and we got a history of some brilliance. Um, when I was growing up, I learned about mental illness because I had an aunt who um, was in and out. You know, back then we had the state hospitals, and in North Carolina, it's a place called Butner, in Butner, North Carolina. And so she'd be at home, and I can recall, like, yesterday, I'd ask my mom, you know, like, why does she go, she's, completely normal whatever seven eight nine ten year old thinks like I don't understand and my mother would try to explain to me best she could because um when she gets home she's on her medications and then she decides she doesn't need it and she stops taking them and she has to go back and so she, my aunt was in this, this cycle this cycle constantly so 50 uh 50 000 for question since most Americans don't have disabilities um why is important why is it important that most people know about the ADA I mean, the, the, the best answer is that they could end up with a disability one day. Um, the statistics say that one in four people in our country has a disability. And so I think it's important to know, like, let's say you never get one. Let's say no one that you love dearly has one. Um, you are likely to interact with people in the community if you do. And so I think it is important to know that they do have civil rights. But I think more important is to know that we can easily kind of trample on those rights and not mean to, not ever know that we are. 
And so I think it's important to know that legislation like this exists to protect them because it reminds us that they, again, they want the same things, the same kinds of protections that we do. And so we need to know when we are on the job, right? We may have coworkers who have disabilities and we need to understand what's supposed to go on in the workplace, what shouldn't go on in the workplace. Certainly if you're in HR or you are an employer, it is important to know what Title I of the ADA says about its expectation of you as an employer, what can and cannot be done to an employee or asked of an employee, um, you know, how things have to be framed. So for instance, um, if a, a, an employer decides that he or she wants to do basic drug screening, under the ADA, that has to be done for everyone. You cannot just do it for the people you think may be drug addicts or be abusing drugs. You cannot just do it. Um, certainly, if something comes up that prompts you to do it, but if it's something that's going to be part of your onboarding process, it has to be for everybody. If your onboarding process is that you want everyone to have a physical exam, then it has to be everyone, not just sure. specific. Sure. So you can't be singled out. Yes, sure. yes. And so it's important for us to know kind of what the law says about things like that. Okay. Go ahead, Alisa. Jay does that. I, I feel like, I think... For me, I think the reason why it's so important for all of us to know about this is because as much as we all could become one, a, a person with a disability, we've all been it. We can all immediately think of multiple stories of people we know. And so um, I think for me, though, kind of giving it back to Jay, uh, since you were saying that you're a disabilities advocate, with the the school 504 plans, is that is that covered under the ADA? Um, not exactly. It has its own... It has its own designation, so it's not even covered under IDEA, which is the um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, so um, for those who don't know, you have special education, which we always think of, and that's IDEA. So that is its own law, and that is for students who have disabilities, and those disabilities may be physical or maybe they are um, intellectual. Um, and those children will have an individualized education plan. Um, and so what happens is that they are assessed, um, they can be assessed like once a year or sometimes maybe more often, and they can be assessed on like 14 different areas. And then that can be things like cognitive ability, but also has to do with socialization and behavior sometimes. And so they come up with a plan just for this student. So kids under IDEA are not expected to all have the same curriculum because they have different challenges. Could, could, and, could um, and when they are, when you're using their IEP, it's going to tell you what the goals are. It's going to tell you kind of the time frame that's expected for those goals. And it asks you to collect a lot of data to decide, to determine whether or not the student is making progress in these areas. Every Let me year they- interject can, real quick. Could you, could, you spell out, could you spell out what is that acronym slowly? I'm not catching it. And then, what, and then say it in the words so that people, parents, some parents who have children with disabilities may need to hear this more. It's, an, it's called an IEP and it's an individualized education plan. So it's just for your student. And it can be done every year, it can be done again. It requires an entire committee to meet on behalf of your student. Um, the parent is involved in that and when the child is old enough, they should start attending their own meetings as well uh, to determine what their needs are and what the goals are. Um, now that's under special education. Then there's 504, like Elisa just mentioned. So under special education, you're gonna see a lot of accommodations being made so that students can access education. So an accommodation, for instance, let's say, like my son, Jimmy, he has autism. And one of his behaviors, he has like a lot of repetitive behaviors and he likes to jump and he likes to bounce. You might imagine that if he can't control that and in many days he cannot, that's impairing to him because he can't sit and learn and he can't sit and do work. So what they found out is that for students like Jim, They'll give him a rocking chair or they'll give him um, one of those exercise balls to sit on and just bounce and he can still do work and bounce or he can still listen and bounce because he has that sensory need based on his disability. So you can put things like that into the IEP so that these students can be successful. Um, you've probably heard like, let's talk about the college admission scandal, right, which is really sad. But you heard about students who were getting additional time on the SAT, right, presumably yes. because they had some sort of a learning disability. So the, the sad thing about it is that this is a real thing. And in order for students to get accommodations like that in school, 
and then later on the SAT, and then later they can get those in college because many people will need them if they have, let's say, ADHD that is severe enough or they have dyslexia. They may need extra time or they may need, some kids need to be in a, in a room alone where there's not distraction and they can be there with a the doctor. Sure. But whatever that, that accommodation is, it tends to follow them. Um, in order so, to... Mm-hmm. No, I was going to say, so, so as, a, as a physician, you're giving us some real down the rabbit hole diagnoses on some stuff, which we want to keep hearing. But um, for the layman, tell us a little bit more about, um, and Elisa, please, again, before Jay goes again, chime in whatever you need, but tell us a little bit more about things like the differences in sort of prejudice and bias against people with disabilities as compared with prejudice and bias against people with racial or ethnic um, uh, issues and then and then and then flow in a little bit about what the ADA has done um, in terms of housing and employment and things like that. But Lisa, go ahead first. Well, you know what I think. So in my school, I actually um, have a reputation in our area as um, it's, it's crazy to think this, but I have a handful and in the past have had a handful at all times of kids who are as young as three years old who are getting kicked out of childcare because they are labeled uncontrollable or they're labeled difficult or or any of those and it's and one of the things that's really sad is that when a mom calls me this just happened last year an amazing mom called and she desperately wanted her kid to be in a mainstream classroom with a teacher that might understand autism and she's she was like it was like she was asking me permission for her son to exist in my school and so i think that uh, this these conversations are so helpful because it's a three-year-old should never be kicked out of somewhere because the someone hasn't realized they can't speak yet and they need speech therapy or they can't you know all these little things that could go and then also when we talk about mental illness uh, parents of children with disabilities have a higher rate of divorce. They have a higher rate of self-harming. They have a higher rate of alcohol. Like there's a bunch of things that are included because of the stress. And I think that's what we're kind of wanting to do as a society is try to, everything can't be perfect and we don't need to send a box of cure-all to everybody's household. But if there's little micro things that we can do to give everybody just a, a, a baseline of of life it was it's just what we need to do and i think having this conversation and jay kenny like you were saying jay gets to go now because she's the pro at this i think it gives us that information we really need well i'll chime in with one thing before to, to segue to you jay and repeat my question but one similarity i know is one that i've observed and by the way i'm i'm very empathetic um when i was in i know eight, seven, six. So third, second, first. So preschool, I was five. I remember, I promise you guys, I remember stuff to like three and a half and four, but I was five. And I remember like yesterday, um, I cried and cried and cried and cried because I felt so much empathy and I couldn't do anything. There were these two twins in wheelchairs in my class and these bullies in like, I don't know, first grade or something upstairs were picking on them and just giving them the blues. And I just remember feeling so much pain for, over that and that empathy. So the similarity that I do know um, exists is that same thing. If you have to feel tall by having someone else on their knees, you've got a problem. And mm-hmm. so I know the same kind of chastising that people used to do to black people. I've seen it with little kids and kids with disabilities. So if you can talk about that a little bit, Jay. Um, I mean, that, that definitely happens, I think, especially with kids. You know, kids can be kind of mean sometimes, if they, especially if they haven't been exposed. Um, but I think that the, the bias that occurs for people with disabilities, I think, isn't as malicious most times. I think that most times the bias is very, it's very subconscious and it's something we're not even aware of. Um, and I'll use myself as an example. Like, I mean, before I started learning about disabilities, I only saw what my son could not do. And I treated him based on what I thought he could not do and would not do. I never saw the range of possibilities for him. And I had to be told. I had to be told that I needed to have some expectations of him. 
Um, and I think that we, we tend to do that because we look at things from our experience, what, how we've seen things become accomplished and what we can do and how we do it. Um, it it's outside of our realm of thinking that, that people can accomplish things differently. So we often don't give someone the benefit of the doubt and we don't give them an opportunity. There's something known as the dignity of risk. And that just says that basically we need to observe people's autonomy and their right to make mistakes, their right to learn. Oftentimes when people have disabilities, we just, we want to protect them, right? And we might mean well. It's like, we don't want to offend them. We're going to say the wrong thing. And we, and you know, we don't want them to fail. What happens if they fail? Or what happens if they try this and they fall and get hurt? Well, what happens? You know, that's how we learn, right? And so when we mm-hmm. deny them the dignity of risk, we're doing that. Sometimes we feel that it's compassionate, but it's more or less pity, right? And none of us want to be pity. So we need to um, kind of become aware of those biases. I think those are the things that stop us from giving people with disabilities a chance to do things. And, and I think that's also where years ago, before the ADA, people just assumed, well, you're in a wheelchair. Of course you can't be at college. You can't be here. You need a wheelchair. You, you know, you probably need to be in an institution somewhere. And they felt like that was a good thing. And so, you know, it asks us to examine um, some subconscious thought that we have about ability or what we perceive as the lack thereof. Well, you know, and, and that experience that I had as a young, young child and that I recall seeing somewhat in elementary school and other scenarios, just like we've grown somewhat as a society based on um, at least pretending to be nicer about it, race and, and, and ethnicity and religion. I think we've grown a lot in that regard. Um, however, we do have a president that openly made fun of a disabled person and mocked them. If you guys have seen that um, video and that's, again, that's not political. That's just what this man did. Um, Elisa, do you have any particular accommodations in your school um, for children with disabilities? You, uh, you know what, we have, we do um, as as few as uh, real quick before before I go to there, Kenny. When you brought that up, it reminded me of something real quick. Um, when I was in first grade, I moved from Hawaii to Texas, and within months of being in Texas, they put me in speech therapy because I sounded foreign to them. Like I got speech therapy because I did I had an accent. That's why, but I had to go to the special speech and so i the, the speech therapist would give us candy after um speech and the little kids would come up and be like oh because you're you know they would make fun of me for being in speech and so i think that's what, what goes and feeds into you know and this was pre the act so you know this was in 88 so you know i think that it's we have made a lot of progress for at our school one of i can say if i had to label the disability that i'm that that we're really great at accommodating it would be autism i'm really comfortable with autism i'm really um i really enjoy giving the parents the ability to see what their the possibility in their child rather than the limitations of what they they think the label of autism is. Um, but in our school, what we do as a school, it, it violates HIPAA, so all the parents have to know. We actually embrace it as a school. So if I have a student that's autistic, my whole school knows that child's autistic. If we have a student who has a food allergy, the whole school knows this child's allergic to peanut butter. So if an adult tries to hand them peanut butter, their peers will stop them if they don't. They'll, and, and so, but even with the autism, I, I'll have conversations with my students and it's, here's how to understand. We have an older child right now who's autistic. He, um, who's on the spectrum and he has Asperger's. We go, with the other kids, I have conversations about how you need to pay attention to to how this so that we can allow that child to be himself but not get upset when he laughs if you fall down he's not laughing at you because you fell down because he doesn't like you like your other peers would be making fun of you he just doesn't necessarily see the social inappropriateness of laughing at someone when they fell down but we do that with all accommodations if it's reading help we've got it dyslexia montessori schools are great for dyslexia um Um, but the hardest thing for us at our school is wheelchair. Um, we've had the opportunity to have some adaptions, but if we don't have a child in a wheelchair, we take those adaptions away. Um, but so we really try hard to embrace everyone and it's not so much for my children who have a disability that's come in. It's really so that the 
other kids in my uh, kid, uh, class learn empathy and how to embrace and how to support and, and not look at people as different and just accept people for how they are. Well, let me tell you a quick little anecdotal thing that I realized somewhere in my teens, but I grew up with a few people who, so I told you about, I grew up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. The school system was, if I had to think about it, uh, you know, 80% white, 20% black, take 1% from each and there was other. <laughs> That's the time that I grew up. Yeah. Um, but the white kids, as I became a teenager and older, everyone was nice. But the people who really seem to, I'm going to quote twice in one sentence, get it, um, it, it, was a, it, it was an epiphany for me maybe at about 20 years old. I was at Penn because I met another white friend at Penn who was the same way. And I went, aha, this person, this person, this person, and this person, here's what they have in common. All four of those white males had a sibling with a disability. And it seemed to shape them in some way that they could see others more openly. Very mm -hmm. interesting to me. I think, um, I think with that, that said, happens. Jay, what do you think? And you, yeah, you want to comment on that, but what do you think? Um, I think it goes together. What can we learn um, from the disability rights movement that we can apply uh, to the ongoing fight for racial and faith-based ethnic equality, et cetera? And I think that's a decent segue, that story I just told. Yeah, um, it is. Uh, actually, I do want to go back to a question you asked, but I think we really didn't. Um, fully look at or talk about. So we have bias against people with disabilities, which I think is largely out of ignorance. But then when we have bias and prejudice based on race or faith um, or ethnicity, there's usually fear behind that. And there's usually a lot of anger and malice also. I think you don't see that so much against people with disabilities. You can see some of the bullying. But I think most times when we see discrimination, it's not based on fear or, or malicious thought and malicious intent. Um, so I think there is a difference. Uh, now, um, the, the two groups, I think it would be wonderful if the two groups could work together. Um, you know, I, I will tell you that um, I think in the civil rights movement, probably there was just too much going on for them to really consider, let's bring in a whole other group. Right. It's just like at that point, I think they were trying to survive and, and have their agenda become public. Um, I think, too, at that time in America, we probably didn't really recognize, again, the bias that was there and how much it might, would have limited people. It was perfectly acceptable in society. Hey, if you have that uncle who's kind of strange, he's a little peculiar, you know, let him stay in his room. Don't bother uncle so-and-so, right? He's just a little touch, right? And that was how we treated things like that, or we put people in institutions at that time. So given the time frame and how we view disability as a country, I think it would never have occurred to the leaders of the civil rights movement that they needed to include this group. And it's unfortunate that the group was not included, but there probably was just too much going on to, to have all of that happen together. Um, I think right now, at least from what I've seen, there's not, there's not a coming together of, you know, groups who are fighting for racial equality and disability advocates. I don't, I don't see that at all. I wish that I did. Um, I know that sometimes, you know, there are some people who um, are disability advocates, they have disabilities themselves. And sometimes, um, and I don't want to speak for the whole group, but for some that I have met, you know, they can be very weary of involvement by those who don't have disabilities. Like, you know, I've heard some of them say it, like, well, I don't think, well, what? what do you have to say about mm -hmm. it? Why are you here? And, uh, and I remember somebody saying this to me about an initiative that we had, and, you know, and I referenced the civil rights movement, and I'm like, you know, there were white people who were very involved in the civil rights movement. And the black people then probably didn't say go away because you don't understand. Pretty much when you, when you really need help, you're just happy about having help. I think you don't really care where it comes from. And so I, I think that the vast majority of people with disabilities do feel that way, but there are people who feel like if you don't have a disability, you don't understand and, and you may not have anything to contribute. So I think those, those kinds of, that thinking makes it hard for two different groups to come together. Yeah. I think you find that within any group. Um, I think we all know that it takes a village and, and it takes people outside of that group, whether it's a racial um, bias and prejudice and we need help from others to help us or whether it's a disability. But there will be people within that group, whether they're those who are disabled or for example, 
uh, uh, with black folks who say, no, what do you know about it? You're white. You can't help mm -hmm. us get out of here. There's always going to be those people. All right. Yeah. Um, here's something I, I wonder about what other people think. I'm on the fence. I don't know what I think yet. I haven't thought about it long and hard enough. Well, I have, but I don't have any conclusions. So we stopped with the state hospitals and the mental institutions back in the day. What do we call them? Uh, I think they even call them, they call them terribly insane asylums or sanatoriums and state hospitals, whatever. Mm -hmm. The point is, one of the jobs I used to have as a chief fiscal officer for, uh, uh, in Oklahoma was I visited every single prison in the state because I was responsible for the budget. When I took over the prison system budget, working for the Senate, it was about 290 something million a year. When I left, it was over 700 million a year. Now, with that said, we may not have liked the old system, but people were safe. We may not have done it the best, and people may have been sometimes ignored by their family members and almost sent away, but I can guarantee you there's something I know now where a lot of those people are. They're in prisons, and they're preyed upon in prisons, mm -hmm. or some of them at their worst, they're basically put in mental straitjackets and left in a cell, and they're on the streets homeless. What do you think about that? What, what would there have been of happy medium or were they better off before, even though that didn't seem nice, that seemed better than being preyed upon in a prison and locked up because people didn't understand what was going on with you or being homeless under a bridge. What do you think? Uh, you know what? I think for me, I, I, I'm with you, Kenny. It's like, do we need an option? Like, is, I think that, Every human, regardless of where they come from, their religion, their color, their disability, or their lack thereof, wants or deserves to have dignity and some level of respect. And I think that when you don't acknowledge and you get, we make it so, it's, we, we want it, everything to be so important that you're the equal. Well, you're not, it's not always the same though. If I can run faster and you're in a wheelchair, and we go on a bumpy path, your path is going to be harder than mine. And, and we need to figure out a way to help you get to the end point too. And, and if there's not an end point, it's, you know, there's housing. If your child is autistic and, or has a disability that you cannot accommodate in your life, if he's violent, if they're aggressive, if they're, they're they need something else, there's places now you can go, but they're, they're no longer, there, there's not, it's not as much as the state funded ones. And so you're going to have to then pay thousands of pounds, thousands of dollars every month. Well, for the parents in those situations, what happens when your parent dies? Or is that automatically inherited by siblings? So I think Kenny, you're right. It's like, how do we go from the stigma of a sanitate a sanitarium or those different group homes that are, are like that and make them mainstream so that it's not such a cliche to put your child there or a taboo to put your parent or whoever is there, but that they don't end up on the streets or they don't end up home uh, in prison or, you know, in worst case situations or murdered because they're preyed upon Kenny. I think that's a huge point. So many people take advantage of these people because it's easy to do it. Right. What do you think on that, Jay? Well, you know, um, yeah, the, the institutions from long ago were thought to be very inhumane. And um, so nowadays those institutions are called SSLCs or state supported living centers. And there's a big movement across the country to close every single one. Um, the Department of Justice has had to really look into a lot that was going on there because, you know, again, people were left there by their families. And, then, and you got to realize, too, though, that we went through a period of time where families just didn't have resources. Like, if you have somebody in the family who has a significant disability, um, whether it's physical or intellectual, um, and you just don't know how to take care of them or don't have the resources to do that, that was all that they had back then. And that was what doctors told them to do. They'd be like, hey, you can't do anything for her. You need to put her in an SFLT. But we know that um, there's a lot of abuse that goes on in those. Um, and, um, you know, it's a lot of abuse and people dying. And so there's a movement across the country to close those. Of course, we're in that space where what do you do, right? If you close those, the people who are there now have nowhere to go. So part, part of what we have to do as a society is start supporting families and people with disabilities from when they're little. 
But that also means that we have to groom society to be ready for them to be in society, right? So we have to change that thinking in order for lives to change. We have to change the thinking that they may not be competent or they may not be capable. And we have to be willing to build opportunities for them and to be in the community, to work, to go to school, um, and to have a better quality of life. Um, and, and if we can do that successfully, you won't see as many going to prison. A lot of the people in prison, as you reference, are people who either have some degree of intellectual disability or a psychiatric malady that just has not been managed well. And that's where they end up. And their families are all tapped out. You know, Elisa re referred to um, earlier in the discussion, you know, the mental health of the family, because that can take quite a hit. Um, there's been a lot of research done around the idea that parents of kids with disabilities um, suffer from a form of PTSD because they have to always be vigilant. There's no rest. There's no rest. Right. You, cannot, right. you, know, you always are concerned. And so, um, and then think about this pandemic, right? It was hard enough for those families who were at home with their small kids. Let's add into it a child who has a significant disability and you're home with that child for months. Right, and there's not really any break. And so I think that that's another place where we have to start looking at laws to support those families. We need to look at laws that support families of kids who have disabilities where you have a parent who has to stop working, take care of that child. Um, there's no replacement of that income in the home. And so I think as a society, we have to start looking at things like that. And, and that's, those are some places where the law needs to change and needs to be more funding to support families so that they can keep their, their loved one in the home and in the community. Gotcha. Um, what, why do you guys think, anyone go for it, why, why do you think that um, Americans with disabilities were not included in the Civil Rights Act? Um, I'll go first very quickly. Um, they say the squeaky wheel gets the grease. From there, what do you guys think? I think Jay kind of hit on it earlier when she was saying there was just so much else going on. And then I think it's also progress. I think at that time period, if you had, uh, if you were born with a disability, you went, you, you were shipped off, you were sent to a sanitarium, you were put in institutions because we did not know about options. We didn't know. Um, Dr. Maria Montessori, the, the woman who designed the schools that I, like um she actually started her schools based on an experiment on children in the ghettos of italy in the sanitariums it was children that had special needs whose parents had dropped them off at sanitariums and um and she was like there has to be more than this and so she you know she saw that there was potential there and i think that's what it took at that time period i don't think anybody was thinking about your grandma who menstruated too extreme and they, you know, they blamed it on her extreme menstruation when more than likely she was bipolar or more than likely she had severe PTSD from a situation. And so I think it has a lot to do with progress, but then a lot with what Jay was saying, there was a whole lot going on. Like we got to make, got to get it where we can. Um, yeah, I go ahead. I think I agree. I think that's what it was. I think it just never even entered their realm of thought mm -hmm. you know it was like we need these basic rights we need to be able to vote we need to be able to go to school and um and and we need to stay safe like as we wage this war we have to stay safe because this was risking your life and and the people with disabilities didn't have a voice publicly at that time right because they were they were putting away so i don't i don't think it even crossed the radar so I uh, talked about disabilities that you can't see. So in construction, a part of my life, there's SD, SDVOB, Service Disabled Veteran Owned Businesses. Um, they get to do business with the government. And to date, here I go with my levity. I'm sure that there's some out there. But to date, every person I know who has a Service Disabled Veteran Owned Business, I can't see it or hear it or feel it. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but any of them. Um, but on a serious note, teach me something here, Jay. Um, I, I interviewed, worked with a guy this morning who um, has a disability. He has a, um, a hand that's a little bit deformed, his right hand, and it looks like he has kind of like a partial thumb and two fingers, but he get, does things fine. So 
one of the spinoffs for construction for me has been the transport of rebar. So I have a little company that transports rebar. Well, when you don't have an employee to do it and you have a CDL, guess who has to do it? So I need to get out of that truck some because I've been in it all the time because there's no one else to do it. Um, and the guy I interviewed today, the third person in two weeks, the first who weren't right for other reasons. Um, but I'm scared to death he's going to hurt himself. So I'm thinking about indemnifying myself because part of it, we're fine with everything except there's a two part trip. It's up and then it's back. And on the back part, the back haul is bringing back blocks and cinder blocks and bricks. And you have to get up on the trailer and kind of move around. And, and the way the blocks are, net, are, are stacked between the sides of the 53 foot flatbed, it leaves about a foot on each side, not even a foot. So you have to balance there, hold stuff, strap over it, et cetera. And if you have to catch yourself, like if you're holding something with one hand, you have to catch yourself with the other hand, how does he do that, right? Like I know he drives, he has a CDL, I have no problems with that. Um, he has a little trouble throwing the straps over. He can learn and get over that. But I worry that maybe I need to tell him, cause I want to hire him, but I'm worried about my own sort of workers comp and, and then to find myself. What do you think? Well, sure. I mean, that's a reasonable question to ask is can he safely do the job? So I wouldn't assume that he cannot. It's just that mm -hmm. you're imagining that he can't do it the way that you normally see it done. A lot of times what we know is that people with disabilities have just a different way of solving problems, right? And sometimes it's outside of our thinking how they do that. I think that I think the question you would want to be asking him is, um, you know, does he have, does he need an accommodation in order to get this job done? This is what I need done, right? This is how we typically do it. Do you think that you can do this or do you need an accommodation to get it done? Because his disability is not hidden, it's not invisible. So you can, you can ask that question. You also would have the right to kind of have him demonstrate for you how he would do it so you can decide if you feel this is safe. He might surprise you, he might have a few tricks up his sleeve. Certainly, if, if he cannot demonstrate that he can do that job safely, then you should not give it to him. And the ADA will protect you in that, in that realm. They don't, it's not a law that expects you to hire people who may not be qualified or able to do a job. You don't have to do that. But if you see that they can do the job and they can do it safely and get it done and get it done you know, at, the, at the same rate that a person without a disability would, then there's no reason to not hire them. In fact, two, things in, be two things in there. It didn't occur to me, and I don't know why I didn't, because I see people do it all the time. I just prefer to jump up and down and move around, you know, like I'm 20. Maybe it'll hurt me later. But there are guys who do this with ladders. Um, and that just occurred. But it also occurs that he told me, so this job on a, on a good day takes about eight and a half to nine hours. On a bad day, traffic, holdups at the plant, at the mill, 12 hours. And he told me 12 hours was too long for him. With a ladder, it's probably gonna take that nine hours to 10 and a half. So we start getting close. But so thanks, I did learn something there. What do you think, Elisa? And, and an accommodation can also be an adjustment in time, right? So um, if, if it's that you have to, he has to maybe take breaks in between, but he can still get the work done. And maybe the day is longer, but it's still, you don't necessarily have to be paying him for the breaks, but it just, you know, depends on what his needs are. You might want to ask him if he's, you know, had accommodations at, at other jobs, at similar jobs, and what those have been, because it's okay to use those. Another place that you can look for help with accommodations, there's a, a nonprofit organization funded by the federal government called JAN, which is the Job Accommodations Network, and all of their resources are free. You can go on their website and you can find all kinds of accommodations you never even dreamed of. Um, that, you know, may very well be helpful. And I think you can even reach out to them for assistance with things like that. Okay. So if, if you can tell, so it's not the ADA will allow an employer to, we can specifically ask, because Kenny, I think that's a great question, because I think a lot of people aren't willing to even give them a chance. And if they can find a way not to, you know, to lose their application, but you are allowed to ask, hey, what, how can you get this job done? And if you can show me, I got, you got it. And that, and it won't be considered discrimination by asking that question? It's yeah, not. Well, today, it's he not and I was, disability is obvious. And so you can ask, how yeah. would you get it done? Oh, yeah, you, you yeah. Want, I, 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 I wasn't shy about it 
today. We, we got along just fine. If I have any problems with him is that he talks incessantly, but um, I don't have to be in the truck with him. So that's not a problem. Um, but I was and very even, open about saying to him, having, I was very worried about him hurting himself and tell me about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, and you can talk about that. You know, th this is a concern of mine. I want to know that you, you will be safe and you can ask him for how would he solve this problem? If it is a problem at all. You might find that he even comes up with things that will benefit other people in that position. Because a lot of times it's what happens. Someone mm -hmm. with a disability, they kind of live with a certain accommodation, right? And they bring it with them everywhere they go. And a lot of times what they do actually is helpful for others. Other people are in the building. They're like, hey, this makes my makes job. Makes a lot easy. of sense. Yeah. Well, Jay, you were mentioning that website um, that gives everybody accommodations. What mm -hmm. are there more websites that go across the bridging, like as far as dis the how the act can cover someone if you're needing help for your children, or is or is there or how would you go about finding that information? Because it would seem overwhelming, I think, at a certain point. It can, it can. So if you're just looking for um, different ways to understand what the ADA does for you, one place I would. Um, I would recommend everyone go is that there's like a national ADA center and um, and then like each region has their own. So like here in Houston, we have the Southwest ADA center and these are, this is a big, huge nonprofit. It has different branches and they have people there. They have lawyers on board. They have um, other workers there who can help you to understand what the ADA says and to help you understand if in fact, you know, if you have a question about whether or not your rights may have been violated or what can you come to expect from the school or from your employer, they can kind of help you um, sort through some of that and then lead you in the direction of a remedy. You know, they, they can't represent you as, their, as your lawyer, but they can kind of tell you, you know, well, you know, there may be some breach here in your rights and this is how you need to, you need to get in touch with um, or just help you to understand the law um, about what to expect from an employer or school, you know, any place that receives public funding because those places have to abide by the ADA. And then of course, when we're talking about like private places, um, if, the, if it's a private organization that hosts public events, then there has to be accommodations made for people who are attending those events. So that's where you get into, you know, the buildings have to be um, accessible, you need accessible parking spaces, et cetera. Uh, another question about current times. So, what about the pandemic? Do you think the pandemic has affected um, or impacted people with disabilities so to limit their access and rights? Have they, have they been more restricted than normally? Jay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, actually, I think that it had the potential to do that, but I think in ways it actually has been somewhat helpful to them, right? Because as we were all working from home, it forced us all to adopt a virtual platform for almost everything, everything, right? And so that is, that is a form of accessibility right there. You know, prior to the pandemic, we were just going to have in-person meetings. You need to get to this meeting, right? You need to get to this conference. You need to be here. Um, but then you can do that. And so in my opinion, um, this was the last frontier of accessibility. You have so many people who um, may have transportation challenges, they have mobility challenges. Here in Houston, for instance, we don't, we have a lot of communities with no sidewalk. So even if you have a bus line that has accessible buses, if you don't live near a sidewalk and you have a, a wheelchair, you can't safely get to the bus line. And if it's yeah. raining yeah. and it's raining on your wheelchair and it's affecting the motor, you can't get on the bus. And so now for people who are having challenges like that, they can participate all the time. And I think a lot of organizations will continue to do things virtually. They may have in-person gatherings, but a virtual platform will always be a part of it. So I think that the pandemic has actually presented that as an opportunity, more of an opportunity for people who are disabled. So my apologies. I think you answered some of that question already, but between thinking about asking it and, and reading it, I missed it. So thanks for saying it twice. <laughs> Uh, what do you got, Elisa? You know what? I think that I think we also have to think about. I think when we think about the pandemic, there are certain disabilities, especially. I'm going to go with the kids. That in order for them to have their window to optimize their window of absorption, then there. If you have a four year old in speech therapy who's not going to sit in front of a computer, then we have to be able to figure out. We either have to get rid of COVID 
or we have to figure out or, or be willing to make accommodations so that that child can get their speech therapy in real life. If you have a child, um, I have a child right now who has um, some physical disabilities. And so a therapist comes to our school two times a week and she ha I have to take her temperature. She has to wear face masks and she also has to be in another room uh, with this child. And so, but I think that that, I think sometimes we forget about with children specifically, you know, the little boy we have with a physical disability, there is a chance that he can grow into a position where this physical disability is a memory. It won't always be gone, but he may be able to um, not grow out of it, but he may be able to learn how to make it be to, I can't even figure out how to explain it without going into inappropriate details uh, that I can't give on him. And so, but you know, it could no longer hurt. It could no longer hinder his abilities if, if he gets his therapy properly. And so I think that's some of the things that people haven't thought about when the pandemic hits is those younger kids who won't sit in front of a computer and still need it. And then kind of letting the older kids go to the computer so that the therapist can focus on the younger kids and and the kid or the people who can't use that computer so what about this I that you said that Alisa because um that that is one area where kids have suffered and that's where it comes to school and special education because when you have those individual plans they often include therapy so there are some kids who get like at least is explaining um, in the public school system they get speech therapy at school as a part of their IEP or behavior therapy or, or occupational therapy. So when you take that away, when you don't have in-person school, they're not getting that. The IEP is a contract, so it's supposed to be carried out no matter what. What happened with the pandemic was that, you know, the IDEA didn't take into account a pandemic. So no one knew what to do. We still don't know what to do. And you have all of these kids who didn't get what their contract said they were supposed to have. So now you'll have families who will be applying for compensatory services and, and they should definitely avail themselves of that where the school district will pay at some point for private therapy to make up for what was not provided. Yeah, you talked about that when we talked, when we had the show about schools opening or not. Um, mm -hmm. Here's one of the places that I'm a person without um, a family member and a disability right in front of me. So it's, it's sort of shameful that I don't know the answer to my question. So this is why we do this. We want to grow as individuals as well. Um, but I know that at one point, um, under this current administration that runs the United States of America, um, they decided to say that people who are here on visas or um, what, whatever we call it with disabilities from other countries, whether they've been here 19 years or 19 days, we're all going to have to be deported and go back. Um, and like so many things um, that we hear about, we're outraged and then it goes away because it doesn't affect us um, directly. Has anyone heard the outcome of that fight? I haven't. You know what, I think sadly it's a, a lot to do with this um, administration, not trying to be political at all. I think yeah. that this administration has, well, I think Twitter has allowed um, our, our current president to tweet out a lot of things that when they go through Congress and all that other stuff, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Can't say that, can't do that. And and it's been proven regularly that that his tweets sometimes get him in, tr in trouble. Um, uh, Barr even said it, it hinders his job as the attorney, uh, attorney general. And so I think, though, that what we have to – uh, my new thing when people are talking about politics, especially with him, is this, and this goes in the umbrella of that, is I regularly say, would you be able to immigrate to our country right now? And I think because he's so, there's so many things that it's, hey, if you don't do this, we, we don't want you here. And so when I meet people, specifically um, Republicans who are still in favor of, of our current president, I ask them, would he allow you to immigrate here? And half of them it would be no. So it's like, how do you support somebody who wouldn't let you immigrate to your country? But I, so I think nothing came of that. I think it was just him talking. No, it wasn't just him talking, but it they was... sent out letters. These families got letters and they were scared oh. to death and they were on Capitol Hill testifying. Yeah. That's <sighs> a, and, and people were trying to get it reversed. That's why I asked the question. Oh my yeah. goodness. It was real policy. It was the ball was rolling. So uh, Jay, you want to take us out? Sure.
Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining us for this discussion and we hope that it was helpful. Um, really, ultimately, I think that whether we're talking about race or we're talking about faith or we're talking about gender, um, you know, ultimately we all just kind of want to live in peace, right? We want to be able to have opportunities to do the things that make us happy. We want economic security. Um, we want to be connected to other human beings. And so that's so much of what um, the essence of the ADA was about when we talk about disability inclusion, that's what that is about. But that's also what we're talking about when we talk about this basic civil rights. As human beings, regardless of our background, we pretty much want those things. We want to be safe, we want to be healthy, we want to be happy. And so um, I think a lot of our show is about looking at how we can find ways to really achieve that as a society and respect that, um, those needs and those desires for everyone, regardless of their background. And so hopefully this show was helpful in terms of you understanding um, how we can support people in the disability community um, and how we can just be more aware of, of the needs there. In the words of Franklin Leroy Ferguson, Jr. <laughs> peace, peace and God, God bless. bless. <laughs>